and grudges and concentrate Come let us sit and try to relate Because now more than ever we must show Discipline, tolerance and production To build a strong and better nation I say that is the main foundation So Let us work hand in hand Because this is our land Come my brother, come my sister And let us build a nation together Success is working hard For our country we must have regard Forget all your differences Let we start to build And on what to progress we surely will Because now more than ever we must show Discipline, tolerance and production To build A strong and better nation I say That is the main foundation So come let us go hand in hand Because this is our land Come my brother, come my sister And let us build a nation together
much of things that we need to see about Surely I do have to spell them out Cause you know as well as I do the only way Is putting more effort and less play Because now more than ever we must show Discipline, tolerance and production To build a strong and better nation I say that is the main foundation So come let us go hand in hand Because this is our land Come my brother, come my sister And let us build a nation together This also goes for every Trinbagonian Who gone to live in a foreign land Now is the time to come home and do something Instead of staying out there and freezing Because now more than ever we must show Discipline, tolerance and production to build a strong and better nation I say that is the main foundation So come let us go hand in hand Because this is our land Come my brother, come my sister And let us build a nation together
Revolution back and I'll die away In short, this is what I have to say Let us forget spites and grudges and concentrate Come, let us sit and try to relate Because now, more than ever, we must show Discipline, tolerance, and production To build a strong and better nation I say, that is the main foundation So, come let us work hand in hand Because this is our land Come my brother, come my sister And let us build a nation together Remember the key to success is working hard For our country we must have regard Forget all your differences, let we start to build And on what to progress we surely will Because now more than ever we must show Discipline, tolerance and production To build a strong and better nation I say That is the main foundation So come let us work hand in hand Because this is our land Come my brother, come my sister And let us build a nation together Things that we need to see about Surely I do have to spell them out Cause you know as well as I do The only way Is putting more effort and less play Because now more than ever we must show Discipline, tolerance and production To build a strong and better nation I say That is the main foundation So come let us go hand in hand Because this is our land Come my brother, come my sister And let us build a nation together This also goes for every Trinbagonian Who want to live in a foreign land Now is the time to come home and do something Instead of staying out day and freezing Because now more than ever we must show Discipline, tolerance and production To build a strong and better nation I say That is the main foundation So come let us go hand in hand Because this is our land Come my brother, come my sister And let us build a nation together
the network. This is a special Independence 43 event. My name is Jessie Léonce and I will be your mistress of ceremony tonight. Before all else, let us all assume the posture for the rendition of the national anthem. Thank you very much, Mr. Isman Lovins, educator and saxophonist. You may all remain standing for prayers being delivered now by Mrs. Claudia Henry. Good evening. Let us pray. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, I welcome you here this evening. What an honor and privilege it is to be in your presence. Because of that sweet presence, we feel peace and we feel an inner joy. And because of the presence of your accompanying angels, angels that are assigned to protect your children, we feel safe and secure. Thank you so much for being here. Tonight I want to thank you for your beautiful sons and daughters of this great country. I thank you for the friends of those beautiful sons and daughters of this great country. And tonight, as we sit at the feet of one of those great sons, we thank you for the wisdom that you have bestowed upon him. And we pray that we will all be inspired, not just to hear, but to do, and to do for the betterment of our country. As we move forward together, duva asam, we thank you that you will continue to inspire each son and daughter here tonight, that we will continue to build our nation as we build our trust in you, believing that you are the giver of all good things. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for being here tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Mrs. Henry. You may all be seated. Good evening to you all once again. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Wonderful. I'd like to say a happy Independence 43 to all St. Lucians on Ireland and in the diaspora. I would like to acknowledge now our distinguished guests who are present here now. We have the Speaker of the House, Honorable Claudius Francis, Her Excellency Dame Perlette Luisi, Governor General Emerita. Ministers of Cabinet present and their wives, Honorable Joachim Henry and Mrs. Claudia Henry, Honorable Dr. Virginia Poyot, we have Senator Lisa Jawa here, we have the Excellencies of the Diplomatic Corps present, good evening to you, and His Excellency Dr. Didicus Jules uh, from the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. We have his wife as well present, Mrs. Michelle Stevens Jules. Uh, we have the Cabinet Secretary, Benjamin Emmanuel, Daryl Montrope, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of the Public Service, Guillaume Simon, Acting Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of External Affairs, other government officials, media, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, everyone here, good night. It has certainly been an anniversary to remember, 43, with an overwhelming demonstration of patriotism in every corner of St. Lucia and uh, every corner of the world. And special mention to the delegation over in, <laughs> over in Dubai making indelible, I dare say, a chilling impact even representing our homeland. And it brings 
again, all the tingles you'd feel from a song from Sesen, from the written word of Sir Derek, and even beholding the Twin Peaks. It is a time of year that we get to recall all that we have triumphed in St. Lucia, more proud with each and every passing year. Our steadfastness and our resilience in the face of the pandemic is another jewel in our crown of accomplishments. What a joyous occasion it is. Now, after all that climax and that pomp of this national milestone in the last few days leading up to the 22nd, you'd think it couldn't get any better. But we are here tonight, and the Office of the Prime Minister hosts as part of the 2022 Independence Anniversary Calendar of Events, the Independence Lecture delivered by Son of This Soil, His Excellency Dr. Didicus Jules, Director General of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. He assumed this post in May of 2014. In this capacity, he is responsible for driving the regional integration thrust towards a single economic and social space involving 11 Eastern Caribbean states. He serves as a board director for Latin America and the Caribbean on the Global Partnership for Education, as well as a current member on the UNESCO board. Dr. Jules has had extensive regional and international experience, most of it focused on education, social policy, and organizational transformation. He served as registrar and chief executive officer of the Caribbean Examinations Council from 2008 to 2014, leading a thorough modernization of the council. And he has also served as vice president of the human resources, of human resources at Cable and Wireless St. Lucia between 2005 and 2008, permanent secretary for education and human resource development in St. Lucia from 97 to 2008, as well as permanent secretary for education and chief education officer in the revolutionary Grenada from 1981 to 1983. He has provided consultancy services to national governments, regional and international organizations in the Caribbean, Africa, Europe, and North America. He chaired the World Bank's Vision 2020 Committee on Education in the Caribbean and has served on many private sector educational and philanthropic boards that include the Caribbean Center for Educational Planning of the University of the West Indies, Mona School of Education, the CARICOM Task Force for the New Caribbean School in the position of Chair, Knowledge, Innovation and Exchange, that is the KICS program, Chancellor's Commission on Governance Reform for the University of the West Indies, Campus Council of the University of the West Indies, Five Isles Campus, Antigua and Barbuda, Car Caribbean Climate Accelerator, CARICOM Education Commission, Co-Chair, Caribbean Science Foundation, Fortune Global Panel Advisor. He holds a bachelor's from the University of the West Indies, Cave Hill Campus, and a master's degree in curriculum and instruction, and a PhD in educational policy and curriculum and instruction from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, as well as an MBA from the University of the West Indies, Cave Hill. He has offered numerous articles on educational policy, educational reform, and adult education in the Caribbean and in small island states, as well as other publications on public sector reform, organizational transformation, and cultural studies. To deliver the independence lecture on occasion of St. Lucia's 43rd anniversary, I call on His Excellency, Dr. Didicus Jules, to present on the theme, Building a Nation and Shaping a Society. Dr. Jules. Podiums are not good for my mouse. <laughs> Governor, uh, Speaker of the House of Assembly, the Honorable Claudius Francis, Governor General Emerita, Her Excellency Dean Pulet Luizzi, 
ministers of cabinet, the Honorable Joachim Henry and Ms. Ms. Claudia, Mrs. Claudia Henry, the Honorable Virginia Poyot, Dr. Virginia Poyot, Senator Lisa Jawahir, Excellencies of the Diplomatic Corps, Cabinet Secretary, Mr. Ben Emanuel, Permanent Secretary, Mr. Darren Montrop, Acting PS Foreign External Affairs, Mr. Guillaume Simon, other government officials and civil society representatives, members of the media, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, present and online, and last but absolutely not least, my dear wife, Michelle. One of the most poignant admonitions of the great African leader, Amilcar Cabral, at the height of the liberation struggle in Africa was to warn, and I quote, that our most fundamental struggle is the battle against our own weaknesses and contradictions. It is an easy temptation on an occasion like this to speak platitudes about national progress and to chronicle the difficulties overcome on the long painful journey that is our history. In St. Lucia, we have cultivated a mythology around the notion of nation and society that provides us with a comfortable cloak that conceals our underlying nakedness. In all of our narratives about both nation and society, there is an implied unity of purpose and public consensus that is not reflected in the reality of the discourse in the public street, in our social intercourse, and is certainly negated by the volume and nature of crime in our society. Tonight, I would like to make an uncomfortable exploration into the structural cracks in the edifice of the nation and the widening fissures in the fabric of our society. But we can keep it simple. I could say my lady quick. <laughs> History is a long journey, a long road in the journey of becoming. For us, the journey started just before we became a nation with what Walcott describes as, and I quote, the long groan that was slavery. The vehicle then was not a bus, it was a carriage. And the passengers on that journey were not us, but the white colonizers. That journey was not a process of becoming, but a process of removing. That carriage was not horse drawn. We were the horses that propelled this vehicle towards a destination of wealth extraction and imperial ambition. Increasingly, evidence is revealing how profitable that journey was. A recent book by Professor Howard French, Born in Blackness, Africa, Africans, and the Making of the Modern World, revealed that the Caribbean was, and I quote, the boiler room of the North Atlantic economy. In the late 18th century, white Jamaicans enjoyed an annual income 35 times that of British North Americans. More slaves were trafficked to Martinique than to the entire United States while the French so prized tiny Guadeloupe that they swapped it for the whole of French Canada. At several points of this journey, the exhaustion of our exploitation led to breakdowns, until finally the spirit of resistance triumphed and the horses were no longer prepared to carry the burden and the baggage of the colonial drivers. We arrived then at the point where, to transpose the words of Robert Frost, Two roads diverge in a wood, and we, we took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. That was the stage of our journey when we became the drivers of our own destiny, swapping the blood and sweat propelled carriage for a bus of our own, driven by our own, towards the destination of our own becoming. And here we are today, 43 years on this journey of becoming. In the life of a person, this is an attainment of adulthood. In the chronology of history, we are still in the infant and formative years of our nationhood and in the shaping of our Caribbean civilization. And now, let us take stock of where we are in this 43-year journey. And how are we really doing in building a nation and shaping a society? And as I do so, I will juxtapose our experience with those who have carried similar baggage and overcome comparable burdens successfully. For starters, let's explore the notions of nation and society. Historically, nations have been forged by blood and struggle, 
but united by a better vision of themselves. They have been propelled by a notion of greatness above the circumstances and the accidents of history from which they are birthed. If you think about it, the progress of every nation has been constructed on its self-definition of its own greatness. There is the American ideal, and you can see it in the slide here. There is the Chinese dream. There is Singapore's global city ethos. Nearer to home, there is the Cuban construct of non-negotiable sovereignty, la patria, and the sacred obligation of internationalist duty. There is the cultural assertion of brand Jamaica, and there is the idea of Barbados, which we see evolving on steroids under the leadership of Prime Minister Mia Motley. As Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez describes it, and I quote, more than any other Caribbean society, with the possible exception of Cuba, Barbados has arrived at a place where its uniqueness presents a model of governance, political economy, way of life, and social order. And the idea of Barbados, he says, and I quote, is a transcendental idea which infuses the body politic and society to consolidated progressive achievements nationally. End of quote. The nation therefore requires an ideological glue that motivates the people to look in the mirror, to see their better selves, and to look upwards to see better tomorrows. Societies, on the other hand, are more organic associations of community, bound by cultural compromises of a common condition. A society is a dynamic and fluid community with its own inherent tensions and contradictions but it is a construct that induces us, despite our differences, to evolve shared practices, a language that bridges our mental frameworks, fusions of culture woven from many historical strands. It is the extent to which these contradictions find common ground that social harmony can be established. Moving beyond the definitions, let us now turn our gaze inward to our nation and to our society. What is the nation of St. Lucia? And what is St. Lucian society? Is a nation its infrastructure, its roads, bridges, buildings? Or is it the stature, or is the stature of a nation the height of its skyscrapers? Or is it the accumulated catalog of its collective accomplishments? Nothing addresses this question better than Derek Walcott in his poem, The Sea is History. And I quote, where are your monuments, your battles, martyrs? Where is your tribal memory? Sirs, in that grave vault, the sea. The sea has locked them up. The sea is history. Walcott's chronicling of our journey from the Babylonian bondage, what he calls the Babylonian bondage of the Middle Passage, to the lamentations of slavery, described by him as bones ground by windmills into mal and cornmeal, to the jubilation of emancipation, which he says vanished, and I quote again, swiftly as the sea lace dries in the sun, and takes us right up to independence when he says each rock broke into its own island. It was the breakup of the West Indies Federation that resulted in each rock breaking into its own island. But it did not take us long to realize that standing as singular rocks in a world of hegemonic alliances was not the pathway to prosperity. It was our own Sir Arthur Lewis who pointed out in his definitive text, The Agony of the Little Eight, to the imperative of unity within the Eastern Caribbean that eventually became the organization of Eastern Caribbean states. While Sir Arthur called for a political union of the Little Eight, he was a bit over-optimistic and may have overlooked how geography shapes the character of politics. The sea surrounding and separating small island states may well be a contributing circumstance to the insularity of our political culture. But that's another story altogether. The genius of the OECS integration project is that it focuses on the practical matters associated with the benefits of scale and functional cooperation to building our nations. What defines a nation? Is it the catalog of conquests of empires past and the imposition of contemporary control? Or is it the humanity and civility of its culture, the distinctiveness of its forms of social interaction, 
and its unique and singular contribution to the global community. St. Lucia as a nation cannot define itself through the projection of military might, as so many aspire to do on the global stage. But military muscle is not the only expression of power, even though the capacity for coercion and the means to impose one's diktat is a law of the, the global jungle. There are many expressions of power, and it is for a nation to identify the, and define the comparative strengths that will represent the projection of its own power. So Cuba set itself the goal of becoming a global medical power, and today the health of its population is on par and even better than many developed countries. The Cuban Medical Brigade is the face of its internationalism. Its pharmaceutical innovations have cured thousands, and as of 2016, coming closer to home, it had trained 30,000 physicians from over 100 countries. The Singapore model is a world-recognized exemplar of a small state with good governance, meritocracy, political stability, economic transformation, technological innovation, and harmonious social order. And significantly for our purposes tonight, Singapore is a country of 281 square miles. St. Lucia is 238 square miles. Singapore did not become a success overnight, but was able to lift itself from an Asian backwater plagued by major problems, including overpopulation, unemployment, major housing shortages, and racial tension to world-class status. And you can see in this slide here the exact location in 1960 and in 2022, and just on an infrastructural level, see the difference. For our purposes tonight, the most important lesson from Singapore is that they built a nation by addressing what I will later describe as the four pillars of nation building, a guiding ideology, a strong sustainable economy, governance of high integrity, and institutional dynamism. And they literally created a unified society with a national identity from a diverse assortment of ethnicities. The Emirate of Dubai, for another example, has positioned itself globally as a civilization of the future, but anchored in its Arab traditions, densely cosmopolitan. Almost 90% of the population of Dubai are expats, but nationals are privileged. The real beginning of a nation, of building a nation, is to conceive an aspirational idea of the best that we can be, and to make that aspiration one that transcends every tribal affiliation within the national space, including the diaspora, and to systematically pursue that dream. It would be well to remind ourselves of Naipaul's advice that after, and I quote him, after all, we make ourselves according to the ideas that we have of our possibilities, end of quote. And to be guided also by his admonition that the world is what it is. Men, and maybe the gender thing is deliberate, men who are nothing, who allow themselves to become nothing, have no place in it. What are the features of our nation that I see? What is our national character? What is the complexion of our society? Both Derek and Sir Arthur on many occasions remarked on the soul of the nation. Where are the expressions of our civilization, our museums, art galleries, our theaters, performing and recreational spaces, our national archives, which is supposed to be the repository of our memories? Walcott's dream was a republic of the arts. Where are the public spaces that refresh our spirits and reconcile concrete with grass and trees, oases of calm in the bustle of business? So how do we shape that future? Martin Luther King spoke to the fierce urgency of now as a challenge of responsibility. There are things that must be done and must be done now if we are to alter the circumstances of our condition. And there are changes that, if done with fierce urgency, will change the trajectory of our history. There is an inseparable relationship between building a nation and shaping a society. 
Both challenges are the responsibility of all, but with nuanced obligations to different actors. Because the construct of the nation is in the domain of governance and its remit spans an ideological, territorial, and institutional architecture, it sits above the society and it establishes the parameters of the potential and the possibilities for shaping the, the society. The responsibility for the nation, it is commonly said, lies with our leaders, as it should. But what is often lost is that every citizen must assume some measure of leadership responsibility. Let us never lose sight of the fact, even if for 15 minutes every five years, the people are the sovereign power in our nation. Above and beyond the sovereignty of the nation is the sanctity and the sovereignty of the people. And in building the nation, this must be woven into the DNA of our institutions. Public services upholding the rights of citizens and responsive to their needs. Every one of us must exercise leadership wherever we are planted, in the every day and in every way. The unraveling of a society starts with small infractions and escalates exponentially. And how can I count the ways in St. Lucia? They are innumerable. Breaches of, you start with minor breaches of traffic rules and they escalate to lawlessness on the roads. The exercise of courtesy to each other in all encounters and note again the increasing incivi incivility on the road and also the ease with which ordinary arguments and differences of opinion deteriorate to violence. All of this is a worrying indicator of the decline of basic manners. The extension of respect to all, regardless of their position or socioeconomic status, and the appearance as opposed to the arrogant assumption of privilege based on socioeconomic class or occupational position. I've heard so many instances where people who feel that they're so entitled tell people, don't you know who I am? So what, we all have the equal rights of citizenship. Our conventional leaders, political, religious, social, civic, who are the drivers of both the vehicles of nation and society, cannot take us forward by staring in the rearview mirror as the past is the road already driven. They must look forward, but they are unable to drive safely if they are fixated on what is immediately ahead, not at the next five yards or even the next five miles, but further ahead, conscious of the condition of the road and most importantly, fixed to our ultimate destination. We all know instinctively where we need to go and what we need to do. During the period 20, 2001 to 2022, we have had five personalities as our prime ministers. And I've done a textual analysis using a word cloud of a random independent speech from each of them. The rhetoric is the same. The language urges national unity, the call to country above self, the priority on the people, the will to succeed. Looming large in the lexicon are the words you see in that map of St. Lucia. St. Lucia, country, people, national, government, economic, respect. If their words align, what is preventing the actions from aligning? Is it the inherent rules of the political game? If it is, then it takes an exceptional caliber of leadership to reach across that divide and give Jack his jacket. But let's not dump it all on the politicians. The same applies to our leadership in all spheres, denominational differences. We've heard the churches competing for market share and decrying each other. Everybody else is a child of Satan except in my religion. Um, business rivalries posing as competitiveness, to name a few. If we don't know where we are going, as I said, any road will take us there. And we certainly don't want to end up in Grosile. No prejudice to the district rep in Grosile if the planned destination was Viewfort. Allow me to end by summarizing some of the critical initiatives that I believe ought to be done to earnestly build a nation and shape our society. One, defining the national ideology, the vision of the St. Lucia that we want. A deep and wide process of national consultation and dialogue should be undertaken. 
that requires that we move beyond the rhetorical flourishes to tangible demonstrations of common purpose. This process must be co-led responsibly by our leaders, political and social, especially in the volatile, uncertain, and complex times that we now face. And leaders must listen more than they speak. And I have a quote from Gladwell. In times of difficulty, what we want from our leaders is not the benefit of their expertise, but the benefit of their humility. Let difference be a distinction and not a division. So let our tribal affiliations, be they religious or political or social, not supersede our national identity. The second thing is institutional revitalization. The invigoration of our national institutions with a responsive dynamism, starting with the democratization of parliament and our governance mechanisms. The restoration of service in the public service and consumer rights in the private sector. The malfunction of institutions is the major factor accounting for why nations fail. And I would urge everyone to read that book, Why Nations Fail. Reshaping our systems of, systems of governance through constitutional reform that establishes clear processes for upholding integrity and for grassroots consultation. Making Parliament a more effective instrument of governance and ensuring continuity of national development initiatives. Can approval, for example, of national development plans be done by Parliament so that we are not subject to a one step forward, two steps backward walls between administrations? From conversation with our erudite speaker, who I'm honored to call a friend of the House, I was advised that Parliament does have such a window of opportunity that can be turned into a door that opens wider avenues of people consultation and participation in the business of governance. And with his permission, I will quote verbatim his advice, so I can't be taken out of context. Standing Order 482, Mr. Speaker, you said, makes provision for a period of time to elapse between the first and second readings of a bill. Regarding the first reading of a bill, all this entails is for the name of the bill to be read out in the House. Debate takes place upon the second reading. The period between the first and second readings can be utilized for public discourse on the said bill. A golden opportunity, therefore, to bring Parliament to the community. Imagine significant legislation that has far-reaching implications for specific sectors, whether we're talking in tourism, in business, consumer matters, whatever, being brought by specialized House committees to town hall meetings all over the country and special seminars with the, sec the, the sectoral groups concerned for deep discussion and consultation. The third thing is design policies or create or strengthen mechanisms of economic inclusion. We do live in a capitalist society, but rising inequality globally is fueling xenophobia, anger, crime. You speak to youth who are engaged in criminal activity, and you will come to appreciate that despair and hopelessness is what fuels the sense of live hard, die fast. Some examples of economic inclusion could be, for example, strengthening and empowering the credit unions so that they can broaden financial inclusion, provide avenues for participation of even the poorest in investment through mutual funds, innovate on SUSU-type revolving saving plans, and so much more. We could require foreign investors to reserve a percentage, whether it's 30, 40 percent, of all investment value for local participation by citizens at home and abroad through local financial intermediary institutions, like the credit unions I mentioned earlier, so that a cleaner in this office here can have shares if we, buy, if we invest in a new in a regional transport system, a cleaner here can buy shares through the mutual fund in the credit union, and also using the Eastern Caribbean Securities Exchange. The fourth thing is rethink education. Education can no longer be just a certification thing, not just knowledge, but human and technical competencies. 
Malcolm Gladwell again reminds us, and I quote, the key to good decision making is not knowledge, it is understanding. We are swimming in the former, that is knowledge, and we are desperately lacking in the latter, that is understanding. Our education system, therefore, must produce critical and creative thinkers, caring and committed citizens, empowered entrepreneurial actors equipped with 21st century competencies. Rethinking education is the key to the fifth imperative, strengthening civil society and empowerment of citizens. Now, this is particularly challenging in this period of fake news and manufactured consent in social media. But there are two dimensions to this necessity. One is the need for civic education from cradle to grave as an essential tool of empowerment of citizens. Unless you know and you understand your inalienable rights as a citizen, a constitution is only words on a page. And civic education is not an academic thing, for as Confucius said, the essence of knowledge in, is having it to apply it. It would be necessary to create or build on existing avenues of civic engagement and empowerment. So the elevation of traditions such as the SUSU, embodied in the Credit Union for Financial Inclusion and Empowerment, the KUDME, important in building citizen involvement in the improvement of their own communities rather than rely on government to do everything. The adoption of the Haitian concept of Teta Sam, which goes further than Kudme. Teta Sam really is about the meeting of minds, hands, and hearts for common purpose, mechanisms of consultation, discussion, and action. Yesterday, I visited Sir Calix George to offer respects for his award. And in discussion, he raised the issue of a thesis done by Raisa Joseph, exploring the potential of Kudme as a tool for nation building, social inclusion, consolidation of identity, and reinforcing resilience. Now, neither Sir Calix nor myself have read this thesis, but we both felt it's something that should be read. And knowing Raisa and from you know, discussions with her at FRC, I have a sense that this is where this is going, and it's something that we need to take into account. These suggestions on the fundamentals of building the nation set the tone for shaping the society. I've already spoken to the imperative of public education, citizen empowerment, and civic education. But shaping a society is fundamentally about managing the many tribes that we all inhabit. All societies face the same fundamental challenge of forging an elemental and binding unity out of their diversity. I described this earlier in the case of Singapore. Each of us, each of us here share multiple identities and we belong to different tribes. Politically, we are red or yellow or blue or colorless. Spiritually, we can be Catholic, Adventist, Pentecostal, Rastafarian, or any other, because there are no children of a lesser God. And we can belong to a multitude of social and or civic clubs and organizations, or not belong at all. These are the tribes that we inhabit. But there are some tribes that are common to us all. It is the tribal, affi these are the tribal, aff it is the tribal affiliations that unite us, that we must privilege, above those that divide us. Yet paradoxically, we must find accommodation for the differentiation of tribes so that while respecting our differences, we can share a common destiny. That is the intersection between building a nation and shaping a society. The intersection between these tribal affiliations are what determines our primary identity, whether as individual or as nation. So as you can see in this slide that is being shown, for the political loyalists, party affiliation, as shown with the box with votes, is greater than national affiliation, which is the flag circle. Have you noticed the phenomena of seasonal participation? Some celebrate independence fervently only when their party is in power and are indifferent when it is out. The nation is strongest when the fever of national belonging is greater than the pull of partisan affiliation. In closing, I wish to focus on the seminal issue of leadership and its role in the building of a nation and the shaping of a society. 
And as I return to this conceptual slide, showing the key elements and the relationship between these two historical imperatives, building the nation and shaping the society is a symbiotic process. The one strengthens the other. But it all starts with our vision of ourselves, hence the umbrella, and the aspiration to our fullest potential. Leadership is essential to this process, and as stated earlier, we're talking about leadership in all domains, the political, the economic, the community, the, lead, the religious. But it is to our political leadership of all colors as the apex of power and influence in the nation that we must look for direction on these imperatives. While we all must play our part and make our contribution wherever we are planted, it is our political leadership that sets the tone and determines the temperature of the national dialogue. Now, historical time is not political time. And what is historically necessary is not always what is politically expedient. But we must be guided by a sense of urgency that is informed by the strategic necessity as well as operational functionality. Let me punctuate this to show why the fierce urgency of now that I referenced at the beginning of this lecture is so important. Our electoral cycles are five-year rotations. Five years in the hunger of opposition may seem a long time, but five years in the pressure cooker of power is not really five chronological years. Let's do the maths. A five-year term equals 1,165 days. 365 days a year by five. When you deduct public holidays, weekends, paid leave, using an average of 14 days paid leave, you are left with a real working time of 233 days out of the 365 days per year. Now, when you take these, 365, these 233 days in the year, in working days per year, this is 233 days, but 24 hour days. You, you break that down to eight hour days, which is the working time. We end up, we recalibrate, we end up with an equivalent of 388 days to deliver in a five year term. Put simply, five years in office equals 388 working days to deliver eight hour working days to deliver. That is the fierce urgency of now that must drive the approach to building the nation and shaping the society. And it is an urgency that must fire us all, not just our political leaders. I leave you with a ballad of simple wisdom by Merchant, which although directed to his Trini King, is relevant to us all. Like the Jesus would say, lick it. <laughs> So come let us go hand in hand Because this is our land Come my brother, come my sister And let us build a nation together We can never go forward if not together. Thank you for, our, for your attention, and God bless our nation. Thank you. His Excellency Dr. Didicus Jules, Director General of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. Was that not very insightful? Yeah, indeed.
I now want to open the floor for any questions, commendations, queries uh, to Dr. Jules. So for those of you who are present, if you want to make a contribution, you can go to one of the mics stationed at either end of the room uh, to, to, to make your query. But in the meantime, I think I'll go first. Um, writing feverishly. Uh, Dr. Jules, how does a, a nation or nation leaders overcome the methodological and practical hurdles towards settling on that aspirational idea that transcends all persuasions, as you indicated? I'm talking about breaking down those systems that have been so well enshrined, systems that have been so well enshrined that like Lot's wife have stiffened any, any movement toward that. I'm talking stratification of society, um, the colonial binds, those of that like. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> I think that it all starts with leadership, as I said. And it's true that the rules of the game have been set, uh, the nature of our political culture and so on. However, it just takes an act of courage to begin. And I think the most important thing there is a process of consultation. Um, we need to evolve processes by which people can, we can consult with people in communities. There are issues of national importance. Our tendency in our current culture is to leave things to our leaders, whether they be our political leaders or our civic leaders, and they make the decisions. But if leaders listen and engage, create mechanisms, as I cited the information I got from the Speaker of the House about how even our parliament with its existing formalities and so on can go to the people and incorporate the views of ordinary citizens. If you want to pass an agriculture, some regulations on agriculture, for example, have town hall meetings with farmers, with rural communities, with people who are involved in agro industry to get their views, to feedback on the bill. In some cases, it may be not necessarily just to listen to them, but also to explain to them what is being thought about to do. So for example, the passage of phytosanitary regulations, that is vitally important if we want to ex expand our exports. But people need to understand why these things are necessary and how these mechanisms are going to work to enable them to export more. So that process of consultation, and this is not you know, theoretical thing. I, you'd have heard from my um, bio thing. I worked in the Grenada Revolution, and that was a feature of the revolution. You don't have to be a revolutionary society to do that. The Maurice Bishop and his team regularly had town hall meetings in every community. As a permanent secretary for education, I recall going to town hall meetings in different communities because they could call a town hall meeting every two months or so, and the subject for that meeting depended on what a poll in the community would say were the issues affecting the persons in that community. So when education, the condition of the school became a problem, I had to go to hear what people had to say about the conditions. And I can tell you, the first of these meetings I attended were brutal meetings because that's the first time you have ministers and permanent secretaries coming into a rural community where the school has not been repaired for 40 years. And they don't want to hear anything. They're just giving you fire because of the condition of the school. And over time, I began to see a shift in attitudes where people would not call you and put fire on you because the school is a mess. What you're doing about school toilets and repairing the schools. When you go there, they would start saying, OK, the school is a mess. What is the ministry doing? And here's what we are prepared to give to give you know, community labor to pin the school. This is what we're prepared to do. What is the ministry going to do to help us do that? So it shifts the locus of responsibility that government must do everything to engage in people in processes of consultation and action that can really make a difference. Now, true, we are bound by the limitations of our political culture. So, I mean, it's in the nature of the thing for it to be a rat race. When you're in opposition, you fight it down. When you're in government, you have to defend yourself, right? But any government, I believe, who takes that kind of proactive approach of listening to people, as Gladwell says, the benefits of your humility, to hear, listen carefully, because there are a lot in the articulation of problems by the ordinary people, 
are also the solutions that need to be put in place that would make a meaningful difference to the people. So if you do that, then there are opportunities now for beginning to change the political culture. And that may avoid the situation where we move from one administration to the next and one administration scraps everything the previous one does. So we move one step forward, two steps backward, and so the dance begins. And let's be clear, we, you know, we have a historical responsibility. If you look at the pattern of elections in the last, what, five, six elections, you realize that the electorate is growing increasingly impatient, right? There's a trend of decreasing participation in elections, and people are becoming more intolerant. That five-year term, which is what, how many days I pointed out mathematically, you deliver in that term, otherwise you're out. Now, what can you, what can you reasonably do to, to design a project and get funding from CDB or any agency? We'll take you at best maybe a year and a half to move from project concept to even tying up the financing to begin work. So we have to take these things into account. These are very serious issues. And you know, it's all well and good to talk about Singapore and we talk about Taiwan and all these small countries like us that we feel are exemplars of progress. But the fact is, you know, we're just looking at other people's reality and not considering what we can do to transform our own reality. Any questions from the crowd? Okay, I'll go ahead. Um, Dr. Jules, is it then not incumbent upon legislators to change the parameters at a constitutional level to enable us to have a more meaningful change, if not within five years, but a longer period of time? Well, I mean, the, the quotation, I, the excerpt I read from what the speaker told me, I saw that constitutional reform was an imperative, but from what um, the speaker explained to me, it is very possible to make meaningful change even within the existing construct of parliament. The rules allow for it. So it's just a matter of being creative and utilizing this, this latitude to get things done. And by the way, that would move Parliament from a very stodgy, formal institution to something that makes sense to ordinary people. Now, if added to those changes that were recommended, you undertake these, these consultations and dialogue in Creole, so you use both English and Creole, it would be an amazing thing. And again, this is not hypothetical stuff I'm talking. When I was PS Education, we designed the education sector plan. We did an elaborate process of consultation. In fact, we started off by looking at reports done on the condition of education and pulling key elements from that. Then we had a meeting of the education officials to discuss it. Then we had some different consultants come in because the original idea was to just hire the consultants to do the plan. We did our homework first, then invited some different experts who had worked globally to look at the, what came out of our initial ideas of what we need to put into the plan. And then we massaged that with them, so there was the international experience brought into the mix. We were clear on what we wanted to do. Then we had meetings in every parish in St. Lucia with teachers, um, with some students, and with parents. And it was amazing, and the, 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 the consultations with parents was interesting because some of the staff at the ministry were saying, well, why are we consulting some of these parents? You know, most of them are illiterate. I was like, because you're illiterate doesn't mean that you don't know what's best for your child. You may not articulate it the way an educator may want, but you know what your ultimate aspiration is for your child, so your voice must be heard. And the, it was a very humbling experience because the truth is, although I'm a member of the Folk Research Center, my Creole is limited. And we had, to, we had to explain it in Creole. So it's one thing when you talk in all this highfalutin language I was using, and then you go in a town hall meeting, and you have to explain yourself. Suddenly, you are the bumbling, stumbling idiot. And the people who are articulating their language are the ones who can clearly articulate what their issues are. Right? So it was a humbling thing. And then, so the officials then began to understand that, look, you know, while we may know our stuff as educators, the voice of parents, the voice of students, are vitally important in helping shape in the future that we want. Thank you, Dr. Jules. Opportunity for questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
queries, commendations, ruminate, ruminate. Hi, Dr. Jules. Good evening, everybody. Um, Dr. Jules, thank you very much for the lecture or the address, whichever one you want to call it. Um, but I think, having been um, a regular citizen and also gone into the political realm, I speak from a different position too. I heard about all these town hall meetings that I did throughout Castro South. But the issue is for me is, the country spends a lot of money in educating a lot of people. And the people who can make the difference are those the country has spent most of the money on. They don't come to these meetings. They are selfish. Because if you look at the majority of people who have had what we call the education in this country, they don't come to the town hall meetings. They don't make any contribution to anything. They isolate themselves. So I'm just saying that it's about time we begin to tell people that the cost of education is that when, you're prepared, when you have been trained, prepared by a country, you need to come back to serve. And the service is not just for you to make a salary. The service is for you to help others come up. And in our system, the teachers are the best. I'll be honest with you. Teachers are the best in terms of those who serve, really, in terms of the education that they've received from the country. And I know as permanent a former permanent secretary in the Ministry of Education, you understand that, for example, about 90% of the education budget goes into salaries. And just about 10% is left to do other things. But I'm just saying that we need to begin to target and say to those whom the country is spending lots of money to train, to make a contribution to the development. Because I have been there as a parliamentary rep, I've invited them to meetings, but they are the ones who don't show up. And you talked about those who are illiterate, they are the ones who generally come to hear and to listen and to make a contribution. So I just want to say, let, do, let people like myself, people like you and others appeal to those like us who have been fortunate to be educated with the country's resources. Force people to participate. So I think the key thing is to just begin the process and you invite one and all to come. And I think over time you will see that that shift in attitude begin to happen. Because in many ways social pressure can build up to shame those people in sitting in their selfish corners and not participating. And also the stick alongside that carrot could be that if we call a consultation here tonight, to determine some new law that has to be passed in St. Lucia next month. Who turn up and who gives suggestions is who get listened to. So if you don't come and add your piece, when the law is passed, it's the law. You have to follow it. That's your problem if your, your concerns have not been taken into account. You know? And the other thing too is even in terms of the processes I spoke in the, in, the, in the presentation about civic education, right? the importance of that, even at school. When I went to primary school at RC Boys, civics was a subject. Now, I do think we should overdo the number, subjectize everything. So we don't necessarily need to restore civics as a subject, but we, we can restore civics as a practice in school. Right? In RC Boys, we were taught um, there was in infant school. I remember there was a song we we sang: "Bits of paper, bits of paper, lying on the floor. Keep the place untidy. Keep the place untidy. Pick them up. Pick them up. And you have to go around the class and pick up all the paper that you drop in the classroom. So it's not for a cleaner to come after you. Just today, actually, I came here earlier to look at the setup. And when I was leaving, we saw a, a, a young child on the sidewalk. He was eating a lolly or something, and he just take the wrapper and drop it on the ground. Now again, that is a little thing, but it speaks to our socialization, right? So how do we engage people? How do we make people play their role and their part? It has to happen at all levels. The education system has to bring that relevance in there. Now if we start in schools, for example, the whole notion of, and that's something we tried, um, you'd recall Robert, in, when we were in the Ministry of Education in Mario's time, that every school should have a student council elected by the students. So, and that becomes, it's not a matter of having a showcase student council. The student council must be given definitive responsibilities 
in the running and the management of a school. And that's not, as some old people might think, turning the school over to the control of students. No, it is helping students to learn responsibility by giving them responsibility. Questions, queries? Dr. Jules, uh, want to inquire, how well is St. Lucia and other small island developing states in your capacity as Director General of the OECS harnessing global support to be able to reach their goals, to build nation? I, I think the person who asked that question probably wants me fired. <laughs> no, the reality is that um, the major challenge, we, one of the major challenges we face, well, the two major challenges we face now is climate change and the pandemic. And while certainly for climate change, after Hurricane Maria, Dominica was the poster girl of the world in terms of small island states and the devastation of climate change and hurricanes, disasters, I estimate a couple billion dollars were promised to Dominica from all sources for support. Did it come? Next to nothing came. The, pro the transformation you see that happened in Dominica since Maria has largely been the effort of the government of Dominica with assistance from some partners, but nowhere on the scale of the promises that were made. We talk about climate change from COP to COP. Promises have been made for all kinds of um, support to address climate change. In fact, right now, I believe the government of Antigua is siding with Tuvalu to bring some climate justice action, to actually create a court case so that the persons who are the major um, causation agents of climate change, the major polluters, are actually held accountable for, um, there's genocide, there's ecocide, for causing grave danger to the world by their economic and other actions. So the reality is that small states are not getting the assistance we need. And I don't think that we should be out there as mendicants asking for help, because that is a, a danger too. I, I quoted Cabral when he says we have to face our own weaknesses and contradictions. We can't go to the outside world begging them for money constantly as a bailout, as a help out. We, there are things that we have to demand as a matter of justice in the world that we must demand. But even in making those demands, we have to ensure that the way in what we do with that money, how we spend it, affects what I call the DNA of our society so that the changes are structural and lasting. And by the way, that's something that I'm very strong about at the OECS. When we get donor funding for any project, it's not about spending that money on a ton of consultancies to end up with paper, um, books on a shelf, reports on a shelf. It has to be something that changes the reality on the ground and in the institutions. So when that funding is done, we are on a different platform altogether in how we do business. So from, as you move from project to project, you are actually helping to move yourself forward institutionally. So you transform the sector in which this thing is being done by the way you conceptualize the project and the way the money is used so that we end up in a different space and in a permanently different space. Because I've seen great projects funded, millions of dollars. After the, and while the project is running, everything it looks, the future looks bright, it's rosy, great results. Five years after the end of the project, it's like a cutlass mark in water. Right? There's no sign that this had any impact on the system and how the system operates. And to me, that is an injustice, not just to the people who should be the beneficiaries, but it is also an insult to the donors who gave that money because all that money was just wasted. Thank you, Dr. Jules. I think 15 minutes has elapsed. Just one question. Honorable Henry, if you could go to the mic, please. I think after that question, we will wrap up for the evening. Thank you very much um, for this wonderful presentation, Dr. Jules. Um, it, when you started your presentation, I think very early you highlighted that um, historically, or the amount of time, 43 years, you said for nation building is we are quite young. Um, and I reflected on how you described 
the journey that we have embarked on. And for part of it, some, I think I felt a bit, um, I'm not too sure if I should feel hopeless um, or what gains we have made, but um, could you um, tell us, do we have reasons to be hopeful, notwithstanding what has transpired, the way that we have moved, um, the the fact that we are we are quite young in on, on this journey, and um, do we have reasons to be hopeful? I I wish for you to comment on this. Well, let me say first of all, if you ever lose hope, then there's that's it. You might as well give up, right? Um, we used to say in RC Boys in caricature of the Catholic Catechism that hope is a motorboat. So it really is probably more theologically correct to say that because if you have hope, it can take you where you want to go. And that's why I said earlier in the task of nation building, the issue of what is the idea of St. Lucia? What is the St. Lucia we want to see? That is the starting point. If you do have that definition, you just... You know, the British give you aid, you do something. We build roads, we build an airport, we build bridges. You know, we extend education, but we're just doing things. But are we doing things towards becoming what we want to become? And that's the important one. And that ties to the hope question, right? If we have hope, now there is a lot, notwithstanding all what I've said. Remember, I did start with Amelka Cabral. The basic battle that we have to face is not our successes. Our successes are our successes. The more important thing than the success that you have achieved is what you could or you, what you should achieve that you've not achieved. Right? I always tell people, wherever I work, we have to judge ourselves not by the progress that we have made to say pat on our backs, but look at where should we have been? Where is it that we have not gone that we should have gone? and to deal with that, because that is how we will make progress in the future. So, you know, hope is an important thing, and there have been a lot of successes. If you look at the history of the Caribbean, and important indices, like all the, the indices that go into the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN, and you compare us 50 years ago to now, you can see on education, the extent of literacy, the availability of public health, as much as we can curse our health systems for its poor condition, there has been progress, right? We've eradicated Bill Hazier, for example. If you saw the interview with Sir John, he spoke about that. So we've made progress over the years. Now, the measure for us is not to stand in the, in the sunlight of that progress and say, oh, we've progressed as a nation. Let's ask, where can we be? You saw the pictures of Singapore. Singapore, around the 50 years, 40, 50 years ago, was a backwater, drug-ridden. Singapore was a set of ethnicities that were in constant gang wars, drug-ridden. It was a dump, right, to put it mildly. And look at where Singapore has come. That didn't happen overnight. And it's not a Singapore miracle. It is the result of visioning, hard work, and some serious leadership because Lee Kuan Yew was pillarized by the West initially as being a dictator because he knew he had to take a hard line on certain things and he didn't hesitate to take it. But he did it with integrity right, and ensured that there was equity, whatever that the differences in society, the different ethnic tribes, the diversity did not become a problem. It became a strength in the end because there was that unifying idea of what Singapore, Singapore can be. And right here in the Caribbean, I believe we are seeing examples of that. If you look at what has happened, I have seen more progress in Barbados in five years of Mia Motley than has happened in 20 years. None of us here, I'm sure, ever thought we would live to see the day when Barbados is no longer known as Little England, right? They become a republic, Barbados a republic, and Jamaica, no disrespect to them, but with Ole Talawa, Bob Mali, Marcus Garvey, where's the talk of you know their own destiny, shaping their own destiny? And, and I just want to end, you know, sometimes it's good to be a radical because a guy called Raymond Williams, uh, a British um, radical, said that the duty of a radical is to make 
hope possible rather than despair convincing. Thank you for closing in on those poignant words. Again, another round of applause for His Excellency, Dr. Didicus Jules. This has been an initiative of the Office of the Prime Minister, the Independence Lecture, as part of Independence 43, the calendar of events. On behalf of the organizers, I take this opportunity to thank and express immense gratitude to you, Dr. Jules, for taking the time to address the nation today and to really take on the independence lecture mantle, I should say, in lighting the way for building a nation and shaping a society. My name is Jesse Leonce. A pleasure to have served as your mistress of ceremonies. Do enjoy the rest of your evening. Happy Independence, St. Lucia. For those of you watching on air online, thank you so much for tuning in. We did see some of the contributions that you made on the Facebook platform. So thank you for listening in and weighing in as well. Do enjoy the rest of your evening. Goodbye. So oh.